How did you not? Oh, there was a new Ed Brubaker, Sean Fellows graphic novel coming out. We sent out these emails. They don't read the emails. We put it on social media. They don't follow us on social media. It or was, the algorithm just doesn't bring us into their feed. Uh, the, the publisher mentioned it. They don't know who the publisher is or care. The creators talked about it. They don't follow the creators. All of this stuff, like, how do you reach these people? Like, literally, it needs to be in the comic shop when they're there. That's it, man. That is the whole thing. In the Midwest, you know the best is there waiting. So come and join the conversation. Highs to approve, fan and artist and creator too. This is how the challenge is too. From Challengers Comics and Conversation in Chicago, this is Contest of Challengers. The lowest of all entertainment. A comics industry business podcast with the scummiest of the scum, the lowest of the low, the stinkiest of the stinky. Well, hello, Dale. Dale Bush. And Poppy. Patrick Brower. Yes, for the duration of the copies of Mayor Goodboy Turns Bad that we have on the website and in the store, they are all signed by Dave Scheid. Five copies. Five, the the five copies we have left. As of this recording, which may not be... Oh, for sure. What's left when yeah. you hear it. <laughs> uh, if you go change that, do you want to do the same to Time Traveler's Tales number one? Sure. Since those are all signed? Sure. During the signing, somebody bought Time Traveler's Tales number one off the website... But I didn't get it signed because I didn't know if that's why they were buying it. And oh. I didn't, like, if they're a Carl Jacobs fan and they get a Dave Scheid signed book, would they be like, you, you, why did you scribble on this book? Yeah, I, I can see why you'd be worried about that. Like, I, I would assume that 99 times out of 100, no one's going to be upset that they got a book signed by someone they didn't know worked on it. Right. But one out of 100 times, someone's going to be like, I didn't want anyone to write on my comic book. Yeah. Yeah. So why risk it? But we did have Dave Scheid in for um, Mayor Goodboy Turns Bad, Mayor Goodboy Volume 3, and Time Traveler Tales 1 mm -hmm. last week. And already Time Traveler Tales 2 is on the invoice for the week. Um, actually, the first week of January. All the invoices okay. I did today were the first week of January. Okay. And let me tell you, there are comics coming out. Oh, nice. Yeah. I was as surprised as you are. It's a pleasant surprise, though. Yeah, it's uh, it's the books that start off the new year, and that includes Duke. Duke number one. From the G.I. Joe universe. My goodness. There's a little... Uh, a lot going on on this <laughs> noggin right here. My, my, my. Uh, thank you for sending me the link of the Hasbro... Uh, the, the final live stream for 2023 yeah. that Hasbro did for the Marvel Legends brand. Yeah. it's uh, Oh, look at that. Somebody just bought, uh, I'm guessing, a Mayor Good Boy right now. <laughs> they did, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well. Four. Four copies that we have remaining. Yes. Oh, I thought you were saying they bought four <laughs> copies. No. Wow. <laughs> Revising the number that we listed uh, 90 seconds ago. <laughs> right? I wonder if uh, anyone will sell by the end of this recording. Let's see. Uh, it's, I, it's so, December, which means things are selling off of the website pretty regularly. Which yeah. Is, I mean, nice. Uh, other websites that I've been to that offer Christmas shipping say December 17th is the last day you can order and expect to get things in the mail on time for Christmas. Sure. And I think that is, uh, what is that? Sunday. Uh, Sunday. Yeah. 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 Real soon. Real soon. Yeah, I, I mean, if you order something on the 17th, which is a Sunday, hopefully it goes out on Monday, which is the 18th, uh, which is the week before Christmas. And that gives you six days. Yeah, I mean, in That's theory. It. That's it. Assuming you're shipping it like a normal way and, and you live somewhere close to a post office, like, yeah, I guess. Now, I don't expect this will happen, but I always wonder if in that time frame someone will order something via economy shipping and expect it by Christmas. Uh, that is their problem, basically. Yeah. Like, yeah. if you're ordering economy, which is like two to eight day shipping, I mean, again, you could be two days, could be eight days, and especially as you're dealing with an overall postal service, um, you would not count on economy shipping uh, to get to you if you're ordering it like the twentieth or the twenty first. Of all of the things that I've sent out for this holiday season, all of my mailing is done. Mm -hmm. 
my Christmas cards went out in three waves, mm -hmm. and I have yet to hear from anybody from wave one to hear if they got it. Oh. And I assume they would have, because those are the earliest ones I sent. Right. And and like we've mentioned, you and I have talked about before, like, other stuff from that UP, USPS pickup has been received by people. Yeah. So, it, it's kind of an all or nothing thing. Like, either everything that gets picked up that day doesn't show up, or it all gets shipped out. And then there were uh, some gifts I sent out to family members around the country, and that those have all been uh, successfully delivered. Yet, if you recall that stack of six um, pink padded envelopes I sent out... I do not, but okay. It was on a, a week ago Wednesday. Okay. Those haven't arrived yet. Interesting. But those were stamped and not labeled, because mm. they were all like an ounce or less. Okay. Like literally an ounce, which okay. is a stamp. Right. So they have yet to be returned, but they also... Well, this mask has to be cleaned. <laughs> Uh, in case I sound muffled, so I'm wearing a face mask because I have a cold, and I, I don't want Dal to get sick for Christmas. Me neither. Because if he gets sick, who's going to work for me? Oh, no. Molly Jane. Yeah, basically. I mean, that's usually the... She's Jewish, right? I That's that's a Molly question. Fairly certain. At least a portion of her family. And Andrew can do it. I know that Gina and Lizzie are, are both out of town. For the entire holiday? Um, Jean is out for a couple weeks, yeah. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. That is a common uh, thing in her family. Sure. Uh, anyway, going back to Hasbro, which we'll talk about for multiple reasons. Okay. Uh, of those figures you showed me. Yes. The uh, Captain Americas, the Sam Wilson Captain America. Yes, which uh, the Sam Wilson Cap, which I can't tell if that's supposed to be the like mcu version or just a comic book version i think it's just a comic book version it's the comic book version uh because he's got the new shield he's a target exclusive yes and then the secret secret empire, empire captain america steve rogers captain america uh with the triangle shield yep and the green and an angry face yeah uh but not like the full hydra costume right that was done in a two-pack right. earlier yeah that one is a walmart exclusive. walmart exclusive yeah it was a weird like batch of stuff that they announced today because it's not like a new marvel legends wave it's kind of like here's a couple store exclusives and then here's a bunch of retro carded x-men 97 stuff and then here's a bunch of wolverine 50th anniversary two packs yeah which are very cool i thought for somebody like me who does not collect wolverine figures yeah i was like oh these are neat like the psylocke mandarin redesign yeah the jim lee did the armor before she becomes like the swimsuit ninja like, that's a cool two-pack. Uh, the Lalandra Brood Wolverine the, If the Brood Wolverine was Pretty a single cool. piece, I would have bought that, because that one is excellent. Maybe there's a Lalandra fan out there that will uh, split that case with you. Maybe. Um, the the Wolverine that's in the Psylocke two-pack is boring. He's just in, like, a black, like, tank top suit. Yeah, that's, like, the, the patch version, kind of. Kind of, without the patch mask. Yeah. But the... Which I think is what, I mean, it's what he wore in that story, I think. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Uh, the Patch Grey Hulk 2-pack is excellent. Yeah, and, the, and their tuxes. The cover from yeah. that uh, Wolverine <laughs> issue. Yeah. yeah. Is that a Basima cover? Yes, Probably it is. Yeah. yeah. Because it's a, a Joe Fix-It Hulk. Yeah. Which I love. And yeah, so I'll, that one that one's a get, and the two caps are a get. Yeah. Well, I mean, luckily, like, the um, the Target one, when it goes up, shouldn't be too hard to get. It'll just be a thing of, like... You're going to wait a while, because yeah, yeah. I think they're both throughout in, like, April or something. Exactly. Um, yeah. And then, But the Walmart one, as with any Walmart pre-order, is like, best of luck. <laughs> I'm not worried. I'm sure I'll get it. For, I, I would be shocked if you didn't, but I've had a number of problems over the years with Walmart pre-orders, because they will take a pre-order, but they won't hold a pre-order. Uh, it is very common to get a pre-order in for a Walmart thing, and then randomly find out three months later that they're just canceling it on you because they oh. don't have it. Lovely. Yeah. Uh, I will be coughing sporadically during this episode, and I will not be editing it out because I don't have time. Okie doke. It's a, it's a busy weekend. Final battles this weekend. I mean... Yes. R -O -H. There's a lot of final battling to take care of. Yes. There's the Dibs Art Show, which I'll probably miss because of my illness. Mm -hmm. The Seventh Corner Gallery, which I would normally have liked to have gone to. Uh, lots of things happening. Yeah. So this is going to be 
uh, a... It's a busy time of year. It's a busy month. Edited one. It is. It is a busy month, and, and there's so many things that I personally do for Christmas that I like doing, but then become obligation. The <laughs> aforementioned cards. Yes. So at the store, we give out, we have the potential to give out up to like 400 cards. Mm hmm my own personal mailing list of cards is like 270 people. Jesus. Yeah, it's a lot. And just, you know, printing labels and putting stamps on envelopes and stuffing envelopes and, you know, signing cards and things. That takes days. Yeah. And uh, there's a bunch of international ones, so I want those to go up first. Sure. To hopefully have a chance of getting there in time, which... The only year that everything got international in time is when I bothered to send them um, priority mail. Oh, wow. International. Sure. Which, it's a lot of money for a card. Ooh, yeah. And I, I haven't done that in a couple years, and I never know. I know one time uh, All Star Comics in Melbourne, Australia got their card from us like in February. <laughs> But that's fine. It's still summer for them. You have months before it's winter time. Hey, sure, but Christmas has passed. Oh, um, yeah. So I guess. We'll, we'll see how they that goes. That's not. They don't sound like six months later for them too. I don't. I don't think so. I assume they do it like June twenty fifth. <laughs> you know, the good news about wearing a mask is I don't feel compelled to cover my mouth when I cough. Cool. As I stare right at you when okay. I do it, as I could feel my nose running. Cool. Okay, cool. that one was forced. Mm -hmm. That one was just for. You just kind of hurt yourself. Why would that? Why should this be any different than any other day? The comics industry seems to be in complete and utter turmoil. And you can't go a day without some other... That was a fantastic segue. <laughs> ...doom and gloom soothsayer uh, scrying from whatever they divine information from and putting it all out on the interwebs yep. to say how bad things are and... Sure. But more importantly... I've been guilty of it myself once or twice. Why? But why things are bad oh. are... Um, just the thing that everybody tries to... People in the comics industry, whether it be fans or creators or editors or publishers or whomever, are all looking for answers within the comics industry, which is fine. But I think we've even talked about on this very podcast that what is happening in comics is happening everywhere yeah there's macroeconomic stuff that is worth taking into account instead of the kind of minutia of uh wolverine comics aren't as good as they used to be or whatever like that that shit is you know missing the forest for the trees yeah also i'm quite enjoy wolverine comics right now yeah me too I was just trying to pick something that no, wasn't I know, necessarily. I know. I know. Like, I, I, know you, I know you did that. I, exactly I wasn't trying right. to reach for an actual hot button I, yeah. issue in comics because yeah. why give that shit more bandwidth? Exactly. But just a few moments ago, we talked about Hasbro, and we found out that Hasbro just laid off. Hasbro boned. Ten uh, percent of their staff. Uh, they yeah, and like collectively, they're laying off like I, a, a ridiculous number of employees, and it's over multiple waves over the next like eighteen to twenty four months. And that's in addition to people they already laid off earlier this year. And basically every division, they're looking to sell off. Um, like, basically, Hasbro over the years has has tried to make its own content yeah. to promote its own brands. And so they've owned different, like, movie studios or production houses or whatever. And now they're looking to completely get out of that because that is a huge money sink. And they've never been able to replicate the success that Paramount had with, like, the first three Transformers movies. Um, and even that was like of a different era. You but, know what they should do? They should invest in uh, new comic properties. Oh, fantastic! Good idea. Like uh, um, space toys. Yeah. Um, Hasbro. A, a lot of it is down to just their action figure lines not doing very well, and you know, there's investor reports that you can look at from different quarters, and they can kind of explain why. But one of the big things is kind of the shift in popularity of some of, like, the... Like, basically Star Wars and, and Marvel stuff, where that stuff is going to be down from a few years ago because a few years ago those brands were massive. Yeah. And now both of them are dealing with, like, people getting burned out on them and not being as interested. Malaise. So you, you get waves of MCU figures now that are just, like, no one knows or cares what it is. 
And when you do know or care, and you want your Yelena y- y- Belova and your crossfires, you mm-hmm. can't find them. Good luck with that. Um, w- which I think from today's Hasbro live stream, they were showing off like they're going to be reissuing some like kind of evergreen Infinity Saga characters. So in, in new packaging, yeah. yeah. So like you can get an Iron Spider and like an Iron Man, even though those characters are not necessarily appearing in that way in these movies anymore, yeah. if at all. Because that was when it was popular. <laughs> yeah. Was it the Red Widow was the first one that they showed off? Yeah, I didn't watch the live stream. I just looked at the coverage that's on Twitter, so I don't a hundred percent know what the deal is. But I think Red Widow was supposed to be a like, hey, this was like a vote character. This was a, I wonder if that was we've a never character. done her before, and yeah. this is the prototype, and here you go. I mean, so I'm sure she'll be showing up in a wave of something. Never having done her before is a is a weird thing to say because she was a niche character created in one Jason Aaron storyline. Yeah, the Heroes Return, Heroes Reborn uh, Avenger storyline. And I don't know that she's been used since. Uh, No, she has not. We had a wave come out this week. uh, Marvel Knights wave. Ooh, Dow just did a wave, everybody. All by myself. Dowed a wave, yeah. I didn't... uh, Nope, thanks. I didn't help. Do my head to fall off? (laughs) And it had uh, King Daredevil, Luke Cage, Blade, who was the uh, Tuper case, um, Clea. Hand Ninja? Hand I'm Ninja. Sorry, fist was, Ninja. Fi- yeah, Fist, fist, fist Ninja. ninja. Uh, build figure was the mindless one. There was somebody else, I forget. Anyway, um, I bought two figures out of there and we sold nothing else. Yeah. First day. And we're getting two more cases in next week. Yay. Yay. Um, it's like the Spider-Man wave that came out two weeks ago. It's like, oh, we're going to get stuck with Mary Janes and Sandmans forever. Yeah, and Matt Murdock's, which is the weirdest thing. Like, yeah. I thought, I obviously, like, the three movie Spider-Mans were going to go fast. And, of course, they instantly sold out. Yeah. But I thought for sure, like, the Matt Murdock, like, he's in a cool scene in the movie. And it's the guy And who, it comes with the brick. It comes with the brick that he catches because he's a really good lawyer. Um... And this is a guy who is in She-Hulk, who is in multiple seasons of the Daredevil TV show, who's in the new Daredevil TV show, who dressed up as a uh, Bluey, Bluey at New York Comic Con. Yeah. Um, it's so, basically your Charlie Cox action yeah, figure. So it seems like something people would want in that he is an action-y character, even if that is not the action-y version. But people, at least the Challengers, went, no thanks. I mean, I was going to get one, but then I'm like, I don't need another suit action figure like whenever i buy a character who's in a suit they're kind of a dull figure i think it'd be cool and i'm not saying this as as a request pre-christmas but i think it'd be kind of cool actually to have a a collection of just like regular clothes people mcu marvel legends characters because there's a bunch now sure you got uh, your Mobius, you got your got Loki. Your Mobius, your Loki, your Charlie Cox, Daredevil. Your Phil Coulson. Your Phil Coulson, your uh, Nick Fury, your uh, upcoming Mark Ruffalo. Yeah. Uh, your um, Skrull guy, Talos. Talos, yeah. Um, I'm sure there's a bunch of other suit people. Did they ever do a, oh, a yeah, Jasper Martin, Sitwell? Martin Freeman. <laughs> yes. Uh, Bl- Black Panther, Martin Freeman. Yeah. Um, Everett Ross. I don't think they did a Jester suit. Well, no. That's a shame. I'm gonna. And Colby Smulders was in her shield outfit. I think. Yeah, so that doesn't not, count. Not. Uh, no, it's got to be. Clo- it's got to be regular street clothes. Yeah. Of some sort. Uh, I I don't know if I would put the uh, Peter Parker and um, Ned high school figures in with that. Would you count the current Mary Jane one? Again, no, I don't think so. I yeah. want it to be something where it's like slacks. Yeah. You know well, what I mean? I mean, she's in jeans and a sweater. No. Again, that's okay. like casual wear. I'm talking like office wear. I'm talking okay. like boring. Okay. You don't just mean street clothes. Generic mean. office okay. wear. Got you. Professional wear. Got you. Well, you can do an offshoot that has Peter and Ned and MJ. Maybe I'm going to do this. I might have talked myself into this. Nice. Just the, the most boring collection of superhero character action figures. The stuff you look at when you see them in a Target and go, what child? Yeah. <laughs> wants this figure spider-man absolutely <coughs> batman you got it uh a wilson brother in like beige slacks yeah <laughs> and yet <laughs> do you count uh hawkeye kingpin in that 
Because he's wearing slacks, but no. he's wearing his Kingpin costume. Yeah, I, I wouldn't because Kingpin, his size makes him visually appealing in a way that defeats the purpose of this boring collection what of What if it was figures. Hawaiian shirt Kingpin? Uh, same answer. Like, no, it has to be okay. boring. And his his physicality makes him visually impressive, a.k.a. not boring. Okay. What about the aforementioned Patch Wolverine Hulk 2-pack when no. they're in the white? Oh, no, no, no. But they're in tuxes. I know, but that's too that's cool. Lax. And plus, like, eye patch and, yeah. like... I mean, not Hulk wouldn't count because right, he's... Right, right. Yeah. No, but, but just Wolverine. Wolverine hair and eye patch? No yeah. way. Okay. Also... Too exciting. Like, white tuxedo jacket and black pants? That's cool, man. That yeah. looks cool. Yeah. That looks classy. Like, tactical turtlenecks <laughs> do not look cool. They yeah. look dull. Sure. That's fair. That's fair. I'm uh, going to have to go on some sort of website and figure out... Who what, you need to get. What, what are the most boring-looking Marvel Legends figures? And here's the best part. I'm sure they're all very cheap. Yeah, so I'm sure you can get loose ones on eBay for real cheap. There's a bunch we just mentioned where I'm like, we've been sitting on that figure forever. Yeah. Maybe I do want that Everett Ross reissue figure. <laughs> oh, man. Earlier this holiday season, I bought a couple of, um, I'm just going to say import advent calendar style um, gifts mm -hmm. for some people on my Christmas list. Yes. List. I got my brother George's Spider-Man one. I got myself and uh, Stella Challenger, the Supernatural ones, mm -hmm. and I got uh, young Dal Bush here to my right, a Common Rider one. I did, yes. And unlike most advent calendars, these were all in the exact same shape and size, like, tackle box, plastic segmented tackle box. Yeah, like it had 24 individual plastic. Like two inch by two inch yeah. square. Uh, with a sticker sheet over the top that was one image, and you have to carefully puncture each day. There's no perforation or tabs to pull. And unlike all advent calendars, these were in numerical order. Just straight up 1 through 24. Normally they're in, in a random order, and you got to find it. Oh, yeah. uh, last year I bought myself a Doctor Who one, which was uh, a TARDIS that had... 24 different shapes and sizes drawers with all sorts of goodies and things inside. But this was, a, in, I think, an Instagram ad that I saw. I'm very susceptible to Instagram ads. That's why they're there. And the huge uh, breadth of subject matter was very appealing. Sure. I, to my knowledge, there has never been an official Common Rider um, advent calendar. Right. I, mostly because they don't do advent calendars in Japan. Like, frequently what they'll offer for the holidays is like... Um, like a little mini cake that okay. comes with, like, cards or some collectible or something it comes with. Well, it's the best my, to the best of my knowledge, nothing in these calendars are uh, edible. Well, if you try hard. So, uh, today is the 14th. Mm -hmm. So, I have opened uh, 14 of my Supernatural Advent Days. Mm -hmm. Thus far, 12 have been necklaces. <laughs> And some very cool necklaces at that. And some very... I don't know if this counts as supernatural necklaces. Uh -huh. uh, one was a knockoff pop, Funko Pop rubber keychain, which is actually the coolest thing so far. <laughs> it's the most toy-like, yes. Yeah. And then one was a button, but, you know, not like... A, a, um, buttons made in America have a very specific... Um, Diameter? A, a, um, technology behind them. Mm -hmm. Foreign buttons have a much different pin back mechanism the metric system and yeah so i have a button uh of the of the 12 necklaces two of them have been doubles one was the same image but a, like a different color background but the one i'm wearing right now which is uh dean winchester as an angel mm -hmm. is an exact duplicate of one i've already gotten oh and both of these images with well, the same image come from the episode I never watched, the final episode. Ooh, spoilers. Yeah. I mean, I, I know peripherally Oops. what happens, but uh, as a huge Supernatural fan, Stella Challenger has told me to never watch the final episode, mm -hmm. and I've taken her at her word. Sure. But I do know this is from that. Uh-oh. I'm sorry. So, she's going to have to get it too then. So it's, a reminder of uh, an episode that yeah. she never wants anyone else to watch. Uh, and then it's funny because like a year later, she's like, you haven't watched it yet? I go, you told me not yeah. to. Very specifically. Yeah. 
Uh, it's it's weird to me that they're all necklaces. That all necklaces. Uh, my common Rider stuff. So I've done 13 days. I didn't do the 14th yet. I usually do it later at night. Um, I've never you had an advent. look forward to all day. Well, I've never had an advent calendar, so I don't know what order you're supposed to... If you're supposed to do it in the no, morning no, when you, you wake do up it that day. No, no, no. At I, any I, point. I, I, I get it. But I don't know how most people do it. If they do it like the morning when they wake up. So you're doing it the, the last one you're doing the morning of Christmas Eve. Or if you do them at night... So it's the last thing you do on Christmas Eve is open the final one. Like, I'm kind of curious. So if, if anyone out there listening who also shops at the store uh, has done advent calendars in your life, um, tell me how you, what your procedure is for them. Uh, please don't, like, respond to Patrick with this. Don't put it on Instagram. Don't leave it as a comment on uh, the Patreon post. Come to the store. Tell me how you do uh, advent calendars. And also, when you're doing that, um, say, when I do advent calendars... And then pause for about 18 to 20 seconds as my brain catches up to the reason why you're telling me this. Because you're because not going to remember immediately that you said this. this. Yeah. So Fair. be like, okay. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, That'll just stop you from staring at them like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Like the puzzle as I, prevent as that. I, as I squint incrementally more as each second passes and then my eyes go real big and I go, Yes. Um, the common Rider stuff I've gotten over 13 days, nine of them were, uh, little figures. Um, some that had like a couple points of articulation, some that were just like almost like keychain guys. Yeah. Uh, and then four things I've gotten have been, I know one duplicate, one duplicate of the action figures. I got an identical common Rider guy, I'm orange arms. Um, and then th four of them have been tiny plastic things. Like one is like a little gnome holding a lute. Uh, one is like a Santa Claus. Oh, Dale, don't forget, you're not current with Common Rider. I am. One is like a little tree, and one is like a, a glow-in-the-dark magician? Do you mean to tell me that there are no trees in any episode of Common Rider? Oh, there's plenty. I mean, there's a bunch in Gaim as well, in the Hellhound Forest, Jesus. I'm this, sure that's a reference This to isn't that, that though. <laughs> this is not one of those. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's fun, though. Like, again, I've never done a... Uh, Advent calendars, so mine's really paying off. I'm having a good time with it. I appreciate it. Thank nice. you. Nice. Uh, advent calendars weren't a big thing in our family, but it's become a thing that I've gravitated to more as an adult. Do you think is is it more like a European thing? Maybe. Because I, I, don't, I don't know. It, it never felt like a thing that I saw a lot of in like stores and stuff in America. And like none of, growing up, none of my friends were ever talking about like advent calendars. Sure. Like that was a done thing. Well, I mean, outside of the context of it being the 24 days before Christmas, I couldn't define what Advent really is. I assume it's like a religious thing, right? I, I mean, I I don't know what religion gives you chocolate every day. The best one. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, a couple of years ago, my siblings and I went all in on... Uh, Aldi does some pretty great Advent calendars, but they did. They started doing wine and cheese ones. There's like a real fan base around them. People oh, swarm sure. when they show yeah. up. And there's they, like they, posts about they, it. Because they start selling them in uh, November. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so 24 tiny bottles of wine uh -huh. and 24 cheeses. Uh -huh. And I got to tell you, the cheese one was just as repetitive as the Supernatural one. Am I wrong in remembering that you also messed up the cheese one? We weren't going to mention that. Oh, too late. Uh, <laughs> so the cheese one had like four different varieties of cheese, but then it would be like, oh, cheddar, but with peppers. Cheddar with other spices. Cheddar, but with something else. Sure. Like, it, it was all the same shape and serving size. Mm -hmm. Just minute differences. So it was a lot of... It wasn't like 24 different cheeses. There's not like even that many... Four different cheeses. Kinds of cheeses. There's only like six kinds of cheeses. If you, uh, if you watch the Monty Python Cheese Shop sketch, you'll know Basically all things six. about... Six flavors, uh, that's it. Norwegian Yalsberger cheese, Venezuelan beer I will, cheese. I will get upcoming uh, challengers returning special guest Lucy Nisley, who's been a cheesemonger, to back me up on the fact that there are really only six flavors of cheese and everything else is just like renaming the same stuff. Wow. Well... I feel like we'd have a battle with occasional challengers guest Rosalarian, who was also a cheesemonger. I bet she'd back me up too. To tell you that there's at least seven. No, it's six. And like the seventh one is like diet cheddar or whatever. It's not the same thing. Diet Swiss is just Swiss with really big holes. Yeah. They just, they shave it real thin. That's all. I know all the tricks. What's baby Swiss? 
It's just a tiny, tiny piece of cheese. <laughs> Hasn't fully hatched yet. Hey, speaking of Lucy Nisley. Let's do it. Not only are we doing an event with Lucy on, I'm going to guess, Friday, February 23rd. <laughs> That's a good guess. Look, I don't have a calendar in front of me. It sounds right to me. Yeah. It's on Friday, February 23rd, starting at 6 p.m., which we normally close. It is going to be for her new community bike riding th themed book i want to say come ride with me i should really have looked these things up before i start talking <laughs> i ambushed you by bringing up lucy nisley i mean i was gonna bring it up you anyway. weren't prepared well no i i, I should be prepared because i was literally working on this right before i came down here here i gave you it out and everything i know because no, you're I'm not sick taking and you're it. like no I'm not taking it. no um, throw yourself at this grenade come ride with me i want to say it's called and it is a, an illustrated picture book about the joys of riding as a bike riding as a community, and uh, it will be a uh, presentation, a Q and A, and then a signing. And uh, Lucy is going to attempt to make custom bike pennants for the kids in the audience. That's cute. But not only that. We are partnering with BFF Bikes, a wonderful bike shop in Bucktown on Damon, yeah. to also be part of this. And that is what I was ironing out today oh, cool. by talking to Kate over at BFF mm -hmm. about uh, their involvement and uh, what they can do for it. Like, basically, they have um, many, many options of what is available to them. They're going to jump challengers. Um, yeah, but only the first story. So we got to make sure we open all of the, uh, there, there's like a sliding glass door right above this door. Yeah, so yeah, like that. just, you'll shoot, you'll shoot straight yeah. throughout onto, uh, Winnebago. Well, I mean, we're only, um, you know, X number of feet on a much wider building. So they just have to get over challenge. They can still land on the. Sure, sure. Yeah. But then they're going to have to jump out. No, they can take the elevator. Mm. That's out. That's beyond challengers. So they've yeah. already they've already covered us. I don't like it though. Well, like I said, they're still figuring out what they're going to do. Okay. So trajectory is part of that. Yeah, a lot of math involved. Yeah, in uh, comic signing. So we're very excited to have Lucy Nisley back at Challengers and to be partnering with a, a very cool and beloved local business who recently moved from uh, Armitage to a much bigger spot on Damon because yeah. people like their bicycles. And uh, it's always great when. Uh, as I was explaining to Kate from uh, BFF, we've always been Lucy Nisley fans, and we watched her grow from a beloved local creator to an international comic book superstar. Yes. And it's wonderful when people like that don't forget us. <laughs> because even though um, Lucy and I still communicate via text on occasion for whatever reason, dumb reasons, fun sure. reasons, what have you, Something like this, which came from Lucy, comes from her team and her publicist. Right. And for all of this, we are not talking to her. Even though I have a direct line, we are following protocol and going through her team. Yes. Because she has a team to set all these things up. Mm -hmm. And it's it's the right way to do it is yeah. through a team. I mean, I, you you can probably speak to this more than I can because I'm usually not as involved with the um, the detail stuff. Um, for these sort of events. But I think when we're friends with somebody who reaches a certain level of status in the industry, um, there's never an expectation with us that we are going to get brought along on that ride. Correct. Um, we want them to do the stuff that's best for them. And so it's when they, they think that we can be a part of that, we'll absolutely be a part. But it's never something where we would be like, hey, Lucy's got a book. Let's, let's text her and make sure that we're on the book tour or whatever. Right. Like we would understand... If she and her team were like, no, that doesn't work for us. Yeah, of course. Uh, there are people like your Raina Telgemeiers, mm -hmm. um, your Nate Stevensons, mm -hmm. people that now we can't touch. No, oh God, no, no. <laughs> but both of those creators did multiple events with us in the past. Yeah. Uh, there have yeah. been... When, when, when Nate Stevenson does... Like a Chicago appearance, it is going to be at like a theater with a large group of adoring fans. Yeah, in support of a major motion picture or something. Quite frankly, of that nature. we're not set up to be able to handle the fan oh, no. base for either one of those creators. No, I basically, if we ever saw Nate again, it would be a thing of like, hey, I can come by and sign some books or whatever. 
if, if they even if they even remember sign us. stock, you know that sort yeah. of thing. Like, and I'm yeah, I'm absolutely not saying that yeah. we're on their radar at all. I mean, that's that's what John Green did, right? And that's the thing. Like, that's that's the level of what we could accommodate with our small space and footprint. And I was over the if, moon if that you he got, even remembered us and you know, wanted to do something half an hour or something to come by and sign some books. That would be awesome. We won't publicize it. Whatever. Yeah. Like, um, and that's fun. Like, uh, that's what we can offer somebody like that at this point, because again, um, we, we just are not set up for everyone who enjoyed Nimona to come by challengers all at once. That would be real rough for you the mean neighborhood. The, the movie. Yes. Cause we did a Nimona signing. I know. This is now the motion picture yeah. Nimona that's sure. on a major streaming service and has been shown all over the world, as opposed to the graphic novel that a lot of people really enjoyed, but was still, at the time, just a graphic novel. Uh, there are two people, two creators recently I reached out to and said, hey, if you are, if there's a book tour for this property, please let me know who to contact so we can get it on the list for this. Right. And uh, one of them was Katie Cook mm-hmm. for her, uh, her, her webcomic that is finally being published. Her second webcomic? Uh, yeah, not Gronk, okay. but... Because uh, that's been published. We right. <laughs> the, the, her, uh, I forget what it's called. Sure. Um, I think it's called Come Ride With Me. They're all called Come Ride With Me. I think now. so. Uh, and that that's an example of uh, somebody who may be too big for us now. Sure. But then there's also... Katie, Katie Cook is somebody who we used to stop by her table at every like C2E2. But then the last few years, like basically, her table is always <laughs> way too busy. Yeah, and we would stop by and the line would be huge, but we would just like get in her peripheral and just wave right. and say hello. Can't even do that now. Yeah. Yeah, it's... it's, it's uh, which is great for her. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and then uh, Joanne Starr is the other one who's somebody who's new in the industry, mm-hmm. as, as as far as we know. Uh, and I raved about her... Uh, Do you remember book? Um, yeah. Uh, Suplex My Heart, I think it was. Maybe called, if that's what they changed the name to. Uh, and I'm like, hey, if you're, doing any, if you're doing a tour for this, we'd love to have you because it's such a good book. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I never heard back from that, which is fine. Um, sure, I mean, it's stuff in your cold column like that. Exactly, exactly. Um, there's God knows how many emails I've probably gotten over the years that I've just uh, never responded to because either it was something where I'm like, this is not a productive conversation or I just mean to and it gets away from me and then someone yeah. has to circle back and then I go, oh my God, I'm so sorry. There, there have been a lot of uh, some very small or um, self-published books that we've gotten PDFs for lately and I've read them and some of them have been uh, not something I think we can work with. Some of them have been things like, well, this is clever, but I don't know. And then in my, I'm not sure how to respond. I just never respond. Yeah. And I mean, there's but, a... but I do, I do read the books. Well, that's good. There's been plenty of people who have reached out about like Kickstarters and stuff. And it's like, I don't, we don't. Kick, Kickstarters, we just ignore. Yeah. I, we don't back Kickstarters anymore as a store because we've we, when almost we used to, they always were, gotten yeah. burned on them. Yeah. Not burned in the sense of the book doesn't come out, but Basically, the amount of copies we have to order, we get them in, and then everyone who would have wanted it already backed the Kickstarter, so they don't need it. And then the rest of our store isn't as interested, and then half the time, they end up coming out from major publisher. We've yeah. gotten a better deal and yeah. ordered less copies. Uh, it's very rare that we sell all of our Kickstarter copies of a book. No. Or even like uh, when <laughs> Jeff Smith did his uh, two key books. Yep. We sold out of the first one immediately, and I think sold one out of five of the second one. Yeah, they usually, I mean, second volumes of almost anything usually bites up <coughs> in the ass. Like, we had the same problem with um, <coughs> the Abominable Charles Christopher from Charles oh, yeah. Herschel, where, like, the first one, we sold through multiple times and had to keep getting more copies. And, and those then, weren't Kickstarters. We were just buying those direct yeah. from his And then the, uh, the his second store. one, I remember getting the second one at a time where money was incredibly tight for us, but it was like, we got to do this, because it's just, it's... We'll definitely sell them. We sold so many of the first one, and the second one, nobody cared. And still, eventually, still have some. Yeah, and I mean, it's not no reflection on the quality of the book. It's just yeah, this, weir- great. this weird thing where we can sell volume ones of series like Hand Over Fist, and then the second one comes out, and it's like no one remembers that they bought the first one or remembers why if they enjoyed the first one. And yeah, it's it's a recurring thing where like a, a volume two for an image graphic novel. Uh, or volume two for an image collected series. Uh, we'll do an initial order, and there's been times where you've been like, 
this is way too low. And I have to go, no, because we're going to sell like two the first week. Yeah. Even though we've sold 40 of the first volume, it's going to take us another three years to sell 40 of the second volume. We're running into that problem with Where the Body Was. Woof. Yeah. Where the Body Was. Really the, hit the, the wall latest, on that one. The latest Brubaker Phillips hardcover. Uh, for the the duration of the five Reckless books and Night Fever, we were ordering the same initial order number for all six of those hardcover volumes, graphic novels. And inevitably we sell out of, we always sell out of them and always need to reorder. And the first prints come with signed book plates. So if you order increments of 20, like we talked about last week, you get... 20 signed book plates. Well, this time I'm like, look, we always sell out of the initial order we do. Let's tack 20 more onto that just so we have, you know, book plates that last longer. And uh, as we discussed last week, we didn't get the book plates and we have no idea if we're getting them this week or not. So we're taking uh, names and numbers as of the very, very few people who are buying these books. So far we've sold it's a, it's a very uh, small list. Six, six copies. Which is um, staggeringly low for the first week sales of a brand new Brubaker Phillips original uh, crime noir hardcover okay. graphic novel. Uh, so we did not sell a lot day one. Yeah. Do you know how many we sold day two? I don't, Dal. I did not work today. Uh, I'm looking at the, the I, yes four. Well, I mean, that's... that's uh... And I'm looking at this, and Patrick, I think every single one of them was a, a subscription. Okay. Oh, okay. It's zero so off, the, off shelf. the shelf, huh? I mean, maybe Woo! maybe one off the shelf. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure they'll eventually go, but it definitely... We did not order to sell out eventually, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't don't want to be staring at 20 copies of this thing in February. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that's, I, that's kind of... To get back to what you were saying before, that's kind of where the market is <coughs> at right now. Like, even the stuff that feels like surefire, it's like, where did this audience go? Yeah. It's not like Brubaker and Phillips doing a crime graphic novel at the end of a year is some new, unheard of thing that we have to figure out, like, how do we sell this? Yeah, there's been, a, a like, a new Reckless the last couple of Octobers. Uh, and, I mean, honestly, even our subscription numbers, that was a kind of internal debate we had. Because what we've been doing for people who get Reckless is signing you up for the next one if you bought the last one. Like, right. if you subscribe to the third Reckless volume... You're going to want the fourth. Yeah, we're just going to sign you up for the fourth because since they're not technically a series, they are individual graphic novels, you have to opt into each one, and people forget to do that. Because, um, And this is a very quick sidebar. So many people uh, do not manage their subscription list, and it drives me insane to the degree where I'm, I'm so close to saying, like, in 2024, maybe we stop doing all of the things that we're doing for people on their subscription list and they can do it themselves because no one's learning to do it. And, and it's, I'm not saying we're going to do this, but there's a frustration that bubbles up within then me. You, you want to, but you know, if you do, it's going to hurt yeah. you financially. Yeah. Cause it's no one's the people who are not taking advantage of managed comics and not taking advantage of the ability to manage their subscriptions. If we stop doing it for them, they will just stop getting books and they won't even know why. Like, that will just be the thing that completely disengages them from collecting comics. So it's like, we have to do it for our own financial survival. But at the same time, it's like, we are paying money for these tools that are free for people to use. All you have to do is like once a month go in and say, these are the things I want to order from a catalog. Everyone orders things online. This isn't, like, a new process either. And yet, like, we ended up having to copy over everyone who was down for Reckless to the new Brubaker Phillips crime graphic novel because so many people didn't sign up for it. And you know they're going to want it. And you know they're going to want it because they're people who've been getting Brubaker Phillips crime stuff for, honestly, some of them, over a decade and I got to tell you, Ed <sighs> Brubaker, has, is, he does a great job of promoting his stuff through his channels. And you and I both raved about where the body, we talked about where the body was multiple times leading up to it. We both um, raved about it this week in our videos. Yeah. One quick uh, fun video sidebar from this week. You know, so I'll, I'll post the things Tuesday nights and it takes a while to, to do it and to feel like I'm really blanketing the 
uh, places where people could see it. It's mm. not just Instagram. It's Instagram and Facebook. Sometimes it's YouTube. Sometimes it's TikTok. But I hate doing all those different things. Of and course. I'm sure there's tools that manage it. And I'm just uh, too much of an old man to want to sit there and try and figure it out. I, it's a full-time job yeah. for most companies to have somebody posting all this stuff. Well, so you doing it after you've already done your full-time job, I get it. Yeah. Well, I noticed that uh, the Facebook ones didn't populate. And I couldn't figure out why. I do it on my phone. And I had been uh, signed in on Facebook on my phone as the divorce gun, promoting uh, upcoming divorce gun stuff. Sure. So they went to that page. Oh, okay. How yeah. did that, that work for that audience? I mean... Real good? The people that liked it there were the people that are fans of the store anyway, <laughs> oh, and they okay. just followed the divorce gun because of me. Sure. Uh, so when I noticed, I'm like, oh, I got to delete those. <laughs> And it's like, I'll get like, oh, so-and-so like your divorce gun post. I'm like, okay, not, I'm not looking at what the post was. No, you just assume it's something about the divorce gun. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, uh, that, that was my fault. Um, and way back in the day, um, Molly Jane's first run working with us, mm -hmm. when she was doing Instagram posting, she would occasionally, um, fairly regularly, post store stuff on her own page for the same reasons. <laughs> sure. And then we've actually said, you know what, I, we'll just... Don't worry, I'll I'll take it back. I'll right. I'll do Instagram posting, um, but it's it's and I do it too now. Uh, I'm sure everybody does. Um, Who has to manage multiple accounts? Yeah. The the problem with all that stuff, and it, it gets back to the the Brubaker Phillips stuff, is that it doesn't like I, I don't want to be defeatist about it, but it doesn't matter how you promote anything. No one is aware of anything in comics until they get to the comic shop, which is one of the reasons why I'm always so fervent in my desire to have publishers overship stuff or make it returnable because if it's not on the shelves in the store all of your marketing doesn't matter none of it matters and like the ability for anyone to know anything that's coming out like we send out multiple emails a week we're posting stuff on social media channels there's publishers who are doing that there's creators who are doing that and everyone's like why isn't stuff selling and it's like because no one's paying attention to any of that and I'm sorry for all the marketing people who are listening to this because that is your job and I'm sure you're going to have metrics and you're going to tell me that's completely untrue. But all I'm seeing is the people who come into the comic shop every single week, none of them know a single goddamn thing until they step foot through the front door. Like literally they see a poster, they see a little printout that we do on the front counter, they see the comics on the shelves, and that is the totality of their awareness of what is happening in comics publishing, period. And it, there's nothing wrong with that. They don't have to be aware of it. Right. But it just means that all those things that you spend time working on, all the like, how did you not know there was a new Ed Brubaker or Sean Fellows graphic novel coming out? We sent out these emails. They don't read the emails. We put it on social media. They don't follow us on social media. It or was, the algorithm just doesn't bring us into their feed. Uh, the, the publisher mentioned it. They don't know who the publisher is or care. Uh, the creators talked about it. They don't follow the creators. All of this stuff, like, how do you reach these people? Like, literally... It needs to be in the comic shop when they're there. That's it, man. That is the whole thing. So hearing still retailers even who are like angry about returnability, it's like, Jesus Christ. I, I, there is no other way. That's it. Yeah. Well, Mark Miller has a YouTube channel and uh, a podcast, I guess. I don't know. I think he writes comics too. You know what? I was going to make a joke about it, but Big Game comes out this upcoming week, the collected the volume, collected and I, I enjoyed that. I had a lot of fun with that book, and I'll be pitching it next week. I've heard that from other people, other fans of, not fans of his per se, but like people who read that book were really into it. Yeah, uh, I will tell you who I did not hear it from. Mark Miller? Dal Bush. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, you only read the last issue. I read the first issue and the last issue. Okay. Uh, I like Pepe Larraz. I... Mark Miller has a very specific way he approaches dialogue that I do not click with. Well, he had a dialogue with three retailers You're this welcome, week. Patrick. <laughs> and he was so uh, talking about... He, he's been on kind of the opposite end of uh, all of the comic discussions. And he's been... Uh, we talked about him a few weeks ago about his ideas. And he really mm -hmm. thinks that it's important for major creators to come back to the big two. And... Um, yeah. I mean, that's definitely like... I. We talked about this, you and I, um, while we were watching uh, AEW Dynamite. It's Wednesday. You know what that means. Um, I got to fall asleep on the couch. Yes. Well, that could be any night, Patrick. <laughs> that could be anywhere. Yeah, but that's the whole gimmick of Brody's 
it's whatever day. You know what that means? Because yeah. it's it's not just Wednesday. It's any day. He said it for every day of the week. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't it when he was the most that's, unhappy at the WWE? Yeah. That that's why it's most appropriate for me to it say is. it for what sure. I did. But now they say it as like a, a, <clears throat> you're, a get ready for a great night of wrestling entertainment thing. It's Wednesday. You know what that means? Uh, and Jim Ross always said it wrong, uh, which is why only Excalibur says it now. <laughs> But we were talking about it just in the sense of like, not me not being able to understand kind of, and it was, some of it was also in, in response to the upcoming FOC final order cutoff for the ghost machine one shot that's coming out for image and how a bunch of creators are kind of throwing their lot in with Jeff Johns to create like a, a weird shared universe, superhero, sci-fi, fantasy, Ever, war, historical everything. fiction, um, thing. And, uh, you know, it's spinning out of the, the Geiger and um, Redcoat stuff. Junkyard Joe. Junkyard Joe. But it's going to be new characters and, and additional creators and all sorts of stuff. And I just, I couldn't figure... I think there's going to be vampires. And, like, we were talking about it because... Also, I made that up. I figured, why not? There may as well not? be vampires. Who knows? Maybe they're all vampires. Um, but we were talking about it because Jeff Johns is kind of a, a name that, to a certain fan, you know, he's a major creator. But I think to most people getting comics now, he's not uh, because he basically hasn't done a major project at a publisher in like several years. If you count Doomsday Clock, yeah, I guess. Um, I mean, that doesn't mean he hasn't had a comic output. He's no, currently doing he's Justice Society comics. of America. But like that's, I, I don't, I kind of don't get it because like it, how it used to work was a very clear pathway for a lot of creators, writers mostly, um, where you would toil away at Marvel and DC, you would become a major name and do, like, huge books, Batman and X-Men and whatever. And then... Go on. Oh, I, I thought you were going to cough. I would I'm going to, but I don't want... Like, it's just part of the background, right? you could just... Yeah. But, like, you would do that stuff. Cough, and, cough, cough. And then you would essentially, like, take off from Marvel and DC and go do your own stuff. And the, the things that you'd own that you would then... <coughs> You know, similar to when the Marvel artist left to form Image, where you would you've done all that stuff, and now it's time to do the thing that you own and make real money. Um, and so, a lot of writers over the years have done that, where they would leave and then go do create their own stuff at Image or Dark Horse or Boom or wherever, and then that would kind of provide for them, like in a way that that doing the work for higher stuff had a very limited shelf life. That was, you know, basically like gig work, and now you need something that's going to provide for you for the rest of your life. But like, it doesn't kind of work anymore, at least from the perspective of a retailer, because these guys, so and all guys, um, they they end up doing these these creator owned books. But in the meantime, like everyone's kind of forgotten about them. Like we're seeing guys like Scott Snyder and James Tynan, and they've huge names who've worked on major books, Batman. Um, but then they're going and doing these comics and it's just these weird diminishing returns where like the fans are not following them to these books. And in the meantime, the idea of like, well, these are going to be like media properties. And so people are going to get excited about them because they're going to get turned into movies and TV shows. I'm looking at the uh, cover price reports, they did a two year one, every, literally everything on the list dropped, um, in price from where it was two years ago, because these things are not getting turned into media properties or they're taking forever. Or by the time they come out, it's a it's a TV show and no one cares and no one goes and buys a book because of it. You're talking about the cover price reflective series. I am yes. Which you talked about last week. I did, and I jumped onto it, and it is such a fascinating. It's movie. amazing. I love it. It's, I love it it's so, so much. Good. Thank you for bringing that You're to our welcome. attention. But they so at, so you've got these books that are then not really selling because the creators once once they end up leaving the major companies, their fans don't follow them and. It, they don't seem to be clicking with the, the medium or the audience anymore. And, and they're not selling a ton. We, we do okay with stuff like, and I don't want to keep shitting all over Scott Snyder, but Barnstormer sold okay. But like Canary was like next to nothing. And uh, we have demons sold okay, but no one buys the trade. Yeah. Um, you know, all these books, they, uh, the, the Francesco Francovilla one, I can't even remember the name of night of the something other um, didn't really do anything. Um, and yet they're like, so I don't understand how it works. Like what is, I can't understand what the, the, the pipeline is for these creators to end up 
like, I, I don't get how it works anymore. It just doesn't make any sense to me. So, yeah, I get why Mark Miller's like, I don't know, maybe it's time to go back to Marvel and DC because I think he's seeing the same thing everyone else is, which is that, you know, you you can be a Donny Cates and work on Venom and Venom is like a top 10 book in the industry. And then you go do Vanish and you have also vanished. No one cares. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, it doesn't make any sense anymore. Like there is, there's no longer the, you know, um, so-and-so was a huge name and now they're doing Savage, like Eric Larson was huge on Spider-Man. Now he's doing Savage Dragon and all of his fans followed him. Like, that's not a thing anymore. No. Like, that's so far in the rear view. Dale, come on now. We do have three subscribers for Savage Dragon. We do. It's finally coming back with new issues. Um, so, yeah, I don't... I can understand why Mark Miller, as a creator, is trying to figure out, like, how does this work now? Well, Dal, personally, I want to thank you for um, getting to that without me having to say, Dal, what's the pipeline? You're welcome. Which was going to be the uh, keyword for when you when you had this... Um, Psychotic uh, rant. D- discussion. <laughs> the other day, and I had so, said out loud, I was like, man, I over. wished uh, I, I was recording that. And you're like, nah, whatever. And I go, well, I'm just going to say, hey, Dan, what's the pipeline? <laughs> and have you bring it up? And you're like, well, let's see if I can remember yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I think I remembered about 65% Yeah, of it. You, you got there. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, just the, the kind of confluence of uh, I don't understand how what a writer's career looks like anymore in major North American comics, because the kind of the steps that they used to go on, which was never guaranteed right now, like every part of it is like, I, you're working at Marvel in DC and no one knows who you are or cares. Um, and I'm not talking about the people who like the, the previous generation, your, your Scott Snyder's and James Tynan's. I'm talking about the current generation. I'm not going to name them my name, but like you're working, they on, know who they are, unfortunately, but you're working on a major book and, no one knows who you are, so there's no not even a chance to go do your own creator own stuff. Or if you are a big name, you can do a creator own thing, and then you never know when some retailer is going to go on Sketched and say, "Don't release four or five new titles. Maybe just release one because no one cares anymore, and you're going to break Karen Gillan's heart." Um, I mean, that's just a random out of the ether example. That could have been anyone. yeah. I'm just pulling names out of the air. Yeah. Um, and then even if you do have a thing, like the the gold rush of getting something optioned seems to be very over. Uh, layoffs at every one of these companies, nearly everyone on Wall Street has shifted from make content and grow your uh, streaming service at any cost to make it profitable yesterday. Which means that the, the like keep optioning a ton of stuff is now like no one's doing that or like they're they're definitely not doing it as much as they used to. Mark Miller did say that uh, back in the day he, when he and uh, Brian Michael Bendis were the two major writers at Marvel, mm-hmm. getting two properties optioned in a year got you more money than the entirety of your Marvel paycheck. Sure, that doesn't surprise me. And that's just option, not anything. Uh, moved on, and Bendis had said previously that the best thing you could do is have have somebody keep paying for that option over yeah. and over. Not make the movie, let it expire, and have them re-up it. He had a great graphic novel from back in the day that I think I still own because I thought it was really, really well done. I do as that, well, That yeah. he wrote and drew called Fortune and Glory. Yeah. And it was basically about him, um, I think pre-working at Marvel, um, or pre-Ultimate Spider-Man, I think, um, where he was shopping around his crime graphic novels that he'd written and drawn, uh, Goldfish and Jinx uh, and Fire, maybe. Um, And talking about how basically, like, there's stages of money that you get. And, like, option money is okay. Um, The real money is when it goes into production. But, like, yeah, the option money, like, you can get option money and they can sit on it for a couple years and then it goes to a different... It goes back to you and then you shop it to somebody else and it comes back to you and you shop it to somebody else and... Like, for a bunch of his properties, they just never got made. There never was, like, to my knowledge, a Goldfish or Jinx or whatever no. movie. It just never happened. Yeah. You, I ha- you I have, have the, the updated edition. Yeah, the updated. I don't, I don't that think you've never you have it. That is correct. I'll see it. It's a black cover. It's next to Firepower. Oh, it's because Firepower covers it up in my, in my viewpoint. I can't see it. Uh, so, this interview I watched, it was like an hour-long interview. It was, mm-hmm. it was Mark Miller with uh, John Robinson from Graham Crackers. 
Phil Boyle from Coliseum of Comics in Florida, who is getting a lot of attention in the industry lately. Yeah, sure. And uh, Ryan from Comic Town in Ohio, and he's been doing this since like early 2000 or so. Okay. Uh, Dal, putting you on the spot, Uh-oh. what do you think single issue comics make up percentage wise of our sales? Of our sales. Yes. Of Challengers Comics and Conversation, what percentage of our sales do you think single issue comics? That's just copies off the shelf. Not back issues, not graphic novels. 30 to 40 percent. Okay. Now, there was a there was a point where we would have said that it was 50 percent, right? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. What do you think that number is for Coliseum? 50 percent? 16 to 20. 16 to 22. Wow. What do, do they go into their pie chart? I mean, do they say, like, where's the, what does the rest of the pie look like? Well, their pie is massive. Sure. Uh, they sell pallet well, loads of pops. But that's the thing. Like, I mean, but they, they, their pie is still, it's just 100%, same as everybody else. No, so okay. Like, what I mean is the slices of, the number of slices of pie yeah. is, ma- is massive. It's not, it's, it's all sorts of collectibles and okay. nerd things and whatnot. A whole bunch of stuff we don't sure. carry. And uh, when he was specifically talking about, well, you know, Marvel has dropped this percentage this year and DC has dropped this percentage, it was John Robbins who said, so what percentage are new comic sales for you? And when he said 16 to 22, John had said, so it's not that big of a drop, really. I mean, I'm sure it's a, a, it, considering the volume they do in everything, yeah, yeah. E- even 16% of a lot of money a store yeah. makes... If if you're dropping a couple percentage points, you are going to feel it because that is someone's payroll. Uh, it 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 was a, it's obviously there's a lot of Coliseum is a collectible store. When yeah. you when you have that many things, that many knickknacks and tchotchkes, I call those all collectibles. Sure, that's fair. we we are to an ex- like we don't use the word collectibles. We sell action figures. We sell toys and stuff. We do. To a very lesser extent. Yeah, and I wouldn't say it's anywhere near what we would consider like an emphasis for the story. Correct. Uh, but anyway, the uh, my favorite quote from Mark Miller was, he was citing statistics about how comic sales in 2022 had gone up over 2021. Sure. And that's, you know, across the industry. Yep. And he said, but... That include, and I'm paraphrasing. Mm-hmm. But and you're also not doing the accent. It's true, I'm not. Uh, that includes things like Dogman and manga. And yes. Quote, your comic shops, you're not in the Dogman and manga business. 100% we are. You know why? Those are comic books. They really are. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of... Uh, the industry is kind of in a very transitional state, and a lot of the numbers that people point at when they're pointing at the the health of the industry as kind of a counter argument to the doom and gloom. Dal, I, I wish you wouldn't use uh, transition as a term because when an an Alzheimer's patient is transitioning, mm-hmm. it means they're dying. Okay. When I get a call that well, says words, your your words mother is transitioning, that, that is, means she's dying. That was the thing that I think you should take up with the people who are calling you because that's not a common thing <laughs> the way that words are used. Oh, no, no. That's, that's been beaten into my head now. That's what that means. So please don't say the comics industry is transitioning. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's not funny. Oh, that's horrible. I'm sorry. So you're saying the comics industry is changing to... I, just that the, the, it's going through a, a, a lot of movement and a lot of alterations. You could say changes. Um, and some of that is, is trying to figure out like what, when we say that comics aren't doing well, let's narrow that down to like what aspects of the industry are healthy and which ones are not. And it's clear to say that the healthy parts are very much the things that people have been beating the drum for, for years, which is, uh, younger reader books, manga. If you are not a store that is giving those a lot of shelf space, you are probably not going to weather the storm as well as you could. Uh, If you're expecting superhero comic sales to be the thing that turns around and, you know, pays the bills like it did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that is probably not a good bet. When I was younger, my mom had a lot of plants in the house. Yeah. And uh, oftentimes they'd be spider plants. Okay. And earlier this year, my sister Susan bought my dad a spider plant as a reminder of our mom. Mm Mm-hmm. 
and she brought it to his apartment and she bought a massive one because it was on sale. Sure. And it quickly became aware that's not a thing he was going to take care of. Right. So it wound up in my possession mm -hmm. and uh, I mounted a hook on my deck and it lived outside for as long as it could, but they're not outdoor plants in the winter. No. So I brought it in, but uh, my place doesn't get a lot of natural light and it needs a lot of natural light. Sure. So a spider plant, uh, as it grows off shoots, it has these long, thin strands that kind of are like fireworks that kind of burst at the end where the new plants are growing. Okay. And this spider plant is slowly dying. But the way a spider plant is dying is a spider plant has hundreds and hundreds of stalk leaves. Okay. And random ones are turning brown and dying. Okay. It's not one section. It's not one area. It's a little bit randomly over the entire plant. And to me, that's comics. Okay. You can't point to one section or one area. Yeah. It's I... all little bits of browning everywhere over the whole thing. Kind of, yeah. It's... Do you like how I made that, like, I tied it back to my mom and my family and also the comics industry? Yes, it's good. Uh, and it's a spider plant, so it makes you automatically think of Spider-Man. I do, yeah. Spider plant is one of my least favorite Spider-Verse characters. Um, yeah, it... it... It's where all of this discussion is coming from. It's why three retailers and Mark Miller are having a podcast. Is just, if this was an easy thing to fix or an easy thing to even diagnose, there wouldn't be all this discussion. It's a, a lot of different people at a lot of different levels of the industry knowing that things are bad, but being unable to either articulate or, or even perceive what exactly is wrong. Like... How again? Just to simple, like to to bring it back to where the body was. Edward Baker and Sean Phillips books sell great. They basically they take up one uh, twenty percent of our crime mystery section, but they probably account for eighty percent of the sales. Yeah, we are restocking yeah. Edward Baker Sean Phillips stuff literally every single week, and have been for years. Uh, we still sell copies on a regular basis of completed series like Killer Be Killed. Fatal, fade out, fade out. Uh, we sell the reckless books like crazy. Like Patrick was saying, we would order forty copies and then sell out very quickly. So we ordered sixty of the new one, and the new one is just sitting there. Now it could be that people just don't know it's out yet. Maybe, but I, again, but my point is, and your point is, we've done everything we could. Yeah, and and yet you're looking at it and you're like, okay, we sold basically maybe one off the shelf on the second day of release. That seems wrong. It seems like an unhealthy industry, and yet it's a tried and true creative team that has won a ton of awards that are working in exactly the genre that people want, that released a book that had been promoted for like six months from the publisher, that we've spent three months promoting, that we did social media posts and emails and, you know, have an entire shelf in our store, and yet it just doesn't sell. So it's like, that is what's driving everyone in the industry crazy with anxiety because it's like, what else could you do? Like the, the discussion that comes up occasionally is retailers saying, well, Marvel and DC need to do this book or that book, and that'll put the industry back on its track. And we had heard that someone had suggested two books and one of them was like, eh. Yeah. But the other one was like, yeah, probably it would do really well. But even then, would that get people buying one comic book or one series for six months or would it revitalize the industry like i don't know uh somebody brought up i think it was phil boyle brought up that there's no car books anymore and by that he means the book that you buy from the store you immediately go out to your car and start reading before that's you an leave. interesting um term and uh, that that wasn't the term he used that's mm -hmm. how i was describing it and i specifically remember doing that when i was younger with like the assassination plot with Spider-Man. So... Or when John Byrne was writing Wonder Woman, I was reading those as I was driving home. Here's a here's a couple ways I would <laughs> maybe dispute me. that. Yeah. Like, one, uh, I, I wish I could remember the book, but I know for a fact that Mike, Michael Romanenko, our subscriber... Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, podcast uh, appreciator. And just one of the best guys. He's a good guy. Um, I specifically mentioned that there were times where he would, he would read a book in the car as soon as he got it. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I would still do that if that was if I was buying comics this sure. way. Sure, there's been a couple books here and there where I've been, as I'm unpacking stuff or pulling things for subscribers, it is very tempting for me 
to just stop and read yeah. it. And I'm like, no, yeah. I got work to do. But like, yeah, man, I feel it sometimes. But here's the other thing. I see car books in the hands of customers all the time. All the time. It's all kids. Yeah. I can't, oh, yeah. I cannot tell yeah. you the number of kids who I hear asking the adult that they're with as they're leaving the store, can I read this when we get to the car? Uh, and the number so of parents that say, still, he's going to have this read by the time he gets home. So, again, kids' books, they love them. They love comic books. They don't love the comics that you and I loved when we were kids. Right. And that's what's maybe causing so much frustration for a lot of retailers is, again, they want to see that, like, why don't kids read Captain America like I used to? Or why don't they read Legion of Superheroes well, like I'm I used to? I'm reading the JMS Captain America, and I like it, but I don't see any 12-year-old giving a care about that book. No, because, and, and I can't believe I'm bringing this back, a lot of those Marvel superhero comics are just action figures of Everett Ross. Sure. It's all stuff where you're like, I get it, that's cool, I like that. No child is going to think that's fun. They're just not. Like, that's going to be boring to them. They don't get it. They want other stuff. Um, and that's... I'm writing that down, although I don't know how I'm going to use it. Because I already <laughs> yeah, have the title for this. But, but like, the things that the kids are bringing out of Sidekicks, and they're bringing so many books out of Sidekicks, um, it, it is stuff like Dogman. It's stuff like the Mayor Goodboy books. Investigators. It's investigators. Um... I'm trying to think of the Marvel and DC stuff that comes out. Like, they'll bring out occasionally, like, Ms. Marvel, Miles Morales stuff, the Spider-Man Spider stuff. Ones, yeah. Um, but honestly, it's not a lot of superhero stuff. They're just not as into that. Yeah. And so, you know, that probably does not mean great things for superhero sales in 20 years. Yeah, fair. Uh, as kids grew up on different kinds of books. And that's why it's sort of interesting to see if we can figure out I, I gotta take another run at our YA section because I just feel like it's not representative uh, yeah I think that uh, we need to really prune the red shelves yeah. there's a lot of dead stuff on there and the tighter it gets the less people look through those yeah I, well I, I took a pass a few months ago and took out like this is sort of we were, a shelf worth of stuff we sort of had a plan to deal with that and yeah. then we sort of forgot about it yeah. so it's like I kind of don't want to do it before the store right sale no, that's fair. That's fair. And uh, also, if you, look, if you look back at... Uh, and we're going way longer than I thought we would. Sorry. Uh, if you look back at the meeting we had at the start of 2023 with uh, Molly Jane and Stella and the list of goals we had, there's some things we just haven't been able to do for technological reasons. Mm -hmm. And then just stuff we never did. Right. And uh, I, we'll talk about whether we have a meeting like that again at the start of this upcoming year. Um, but also, uh, good friend of the podcast and the, um, the number one member of the Brian Garside fan club, Django Boren, president, I'm sorry, it was president of the Brian Garside fan club, Django Boren. I still have not got my membership card. Posted a list of things that he's doing in his store and they all sound really fun and really involved a way to get people to come in mm -hmm. and it sounds exhausting sure and i look at the list and say i would never want to do that yeah just because of the work involved in it and that's i mean some of that is stuff that that we've been running challengers for almost 16 years and so you know 14 years ago we would have been like yeah let's try it let's do all yeah. that stuff yeah and there was a period where a, a uh marketing person who was a former retailer had basically said like when i was a retailer these are the things that we did to get more community involvement, get more people in the store. And we tried them and no one cared. And we just went, all right, well, that was a lot of work for no reward. Shout out to Esther. <laughs> Thank you, Esther, for the suggestions that did not pan out for us at all. Um, and that's, I, I, it's hard to, to muster up the enthusiasm to try a lot of that stuff one more time because it's like, I, some of it is just, maybe it, 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 if we believed in it more, it would succeed more because we would have that. Right. It would feel yeah. like, oh, wow, they're really excited about this. Instead of like, I don't know, we did this. I hope people show up. Oh, they didn't. Okay, well, we're never doing this again. Okay, but I think the biggest reason that we don't do a lot of those things is now, I just want to go home. Yeah, I. this is something I, I think, live far away now. Yeah, I mean, this is something we mentioned an episode ago or two episodes ago is that when you're a new store, when you're a young store, 
it's very easy to find the energy to do that stuff. It's very easy to find the excitement to try new stuff, meet new people, <coughs> um, make a name for yourself, plant your flag. But when you're a more mature store, when you've been doing it at, at one location in one storefront um, for you know over 10 years, over 15 years, you just want to yeah, sell the it's books. It's been over 15 years. Where is our 15 years of service? Wicker Park Buck Down Chamber of Commerce, where you give out Never gonna go. stickers to stores that have been in the neighborhood for over 15 years. It's well over 15 years. Where's ours? Why yeah. are we keep o- being overlooked? Where's my elephant? Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up this one thing that I think we'll call it a night. Okay. Challengers is up for the uh, best comic shop in uh, the, I don't know, the reader? Yeah, the reader best <laughs> of 2023. Somewhere. And thank, thank you. Publication. Uh, there's there's a there's like five or there's like six stores up for it. Okay. Um, including like brand new stores like uh, Goblin Market and newish stores like Howling Pages, uh, and standbys like uh, Graham Crackers Downtown and Alley Cat. Mm-hmm. Weirdly, not Quimby's. Wow. Yeah, Quimby's isn't in it. And a lot of these newer stores are doing. Big social media pushes for people voting. Sure, we've done it before. Um, yeah, and we've done it before, and we haven't done it the last couple of rounds. No. Because it's not that we don't care. We love the recognition, but the recognition doesn't translate into what you think it was. And uh, the Gava Market kids are like, hey, this is a really good way to get good uh, good attention for us and sure. to get people to know we're there. And I'm like, yeah, we used to think that too. And it doesn't. I mean, I think it might if you're brand new. If yeah. people literally don't know you exist and you're looking at a list of the best stores in the city and you're like, I don't know what Goblin Market is, well, maybe you make a trip out there. We won Best New Art Gallery for Rogue's Gallery. Well, how's the art gallery doing, Patrick? Really uh-huh. Good? Uh-huh. Still got some prints in the back. Um, we saw one every couple yeah, of months. I, you know, as always, it's nice to be nominated. It'd be nice to win. But, like, I I don't want to say it's a popularity contest, but it basically is a popularity contest. And so it's, it's not, like... Your, your I, ability I am, to win is almost entirely tied to your ability to mobilize your customers and at a certain point i don't want to bother our people with that right and i am more than happy for a goblin market or a howling pages sure. to win i wish them the best yeah exactly like let let the someone new take that baton <laughs> sure we've won our fair share awards we yeah. we have enough yeah we've won the eisner we did and after that it's like okay well let's just run a business <laughs> yeah kind of I, I would rather just sell books if that's at all possible yeah. in 2023 and 2024. There's a point when we were going for that Eisner really hard and Eric Thornton from Chicago Comics said, do you want to buy ours? Yeah. It's never done a thing for it doesn't us. doesn't matter. Uh, we had, so a woman came in, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday, and she was buying some stuff and she needed some recommendations for uh, Christmas gifts. And so I helped her out and it was stuff from Sidekicks. Um, and as she's about to pay, she's like, oh, and uh, I just want to say, I saw I saw you on uh, Tune In With Tune Me. Tune In With Me, yeah. That was really fun. I'm like, oh, thank you so much. That was, it was nice to do it. Did that bring in a lot of business? Uh, <laughs> not really, no. What? Is that why she came in? No, I think she'd, she'd already been aware of us. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, she didn't say she came in because of that. She was just like, tell, I saw, I saw tell, you on it. Don't forget, somebody immediately bought all three of our Looney uh-huh. Tunes single issue comics. I'm like, look, it was really fun to do. I don't know that it, it, it really made people who shop at comic stores really aware of us. But, I mean, we'd gladly do it again if they offered us the oh, chance. And it was nice to do. Yeah. For sure. But yeah, it was this perception of like, you were on a TV show. It must have brought so much business. And it's like, it doesn't. That's not how it works. Again, you could be on a TV show and no one knows or cares and is going to do anything about it. Yeah. Uh, well, Dell, I will tell you, and this is very cryptic to you specifically, oh. I had an idea during this recording of an old school marketing trick that I'm going to slowly check in to see if the technology has caught up to a place where... It would be viable before I uh, start to do it. But it's the thing I thought, like, that could be real fun to do again. Okay. Um, but it has to go on the bottom of my list of things to do because I got a million things to do. And December's a busy month. Yeah. Uh, also, like, the whole back issue thing we talked about two weeks ago, I haven't taken any steps towards. Okay. So I got to get a move on. Uh, and that's why we're ending. Thank you for listening and happy holidays. Yep. Keep reading comics and Merry Christmas. This has been Contest of Challengers. Thanks for listening. Keep reading comics. Challengers is located at 1845 Northwestern Avenue in the Bucktown neighborhood of Chicago, 773-278-0155. Keep up to date with new releases and events at challengerscomics.com. 
and help fund this podcast at patreon.com slash challengers.